power, also known as technology. As educators, parents, researchers, and industry, we need to take this moment very seriously. AI isn't new. So how did it move from a modest backwater to the crown jewel of engineering programs? How are tech monopolies positioning themselves for the coming AI gold rush? Now, Meredith Whitaker was one of the core organizers of the 2018 Google Walkouts and is a co-founder of the AI Now Institute. She made a bold move to completely rewrite her talk in light of the recent events with Google's ethical AI team. Uh, comment from Edna, great insights. Thanks, I'm following. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Meredith explained that most people don't see that, and this is her quote, concentrated power is masquerading as technology innovation. Tech rebelled against retail media and how we communicate. And so now these tech monopolies put control of entire industries in the hands of fewer and fewer people. So how much, how much power are we talking about here? Like, are tech companies as powerful as a city? Are they as powerful as a country? Write it in the comments. Yes or no. Would you say Google is as powerful as a country? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's right. Some of you saw this power being exercised on February 18th when Facebook decided to flip a switch and shut down all news for a country on their platform. Would the Australian, like, would Australia's own government be able to shut down all news as easily as Facebook was able to? No, probably not. Now, if you don't like who's leading your government, you can vote for the opposition. But if you don't like Facebook, you don't get a say in who is the next CEO. The super voting share structure of tech companies gives some founders 20 times the voting rights of regular shareholders uh, that like shares that you can buy on the stock market. And as a result, Mark Zuckerberg owns 60% of all voting shares for Facebook. Sergey Brin and Larry Page own 51% of all voting shares of Alphabet. Super voting shares have created a tech nobility that is immune to public outcry. They're not afraid. <laughs> Edna, oh, I gotta, gotta bring this on in. Thank you uh, for sharing, Edna. Um, Edna says, yes, Google is powerful as a nation. Great insights. Thanks, I'm following. Thanks so much, Edna. There's another challenge. A lot of the progress in AI has been due to access to much, much more computing power and much more input data. And so for this reason, 
academics have dual affiliation as both academics and industry. Like, for example, um, I work for a university or and I work for Google at the same time. So like I'm an adjunct at the university, but I am also employed by Google. Um, myself, uh, I experienced this myself and I'm thankful for having both industry and academic affiliation during my PhD in computer science because it exposed me to many real world problems and it gave me access to equipment that I would otherwise not have had available. Researchers like us have no choice but to rely on the tech giants for the infrastructure to advance the state of the art. Academics conferences themselves are expensive. So we are thankful for the sponsorship from big tech companies. But what happens when you bite the hand that feeds you as a researcher? People know who pays them. Meredith Whitaker said, it's unfair to assume that someone funded by a company cannot be critical of big tech. That's true. Many examples exist of being critical of big tech, which didn't have the consequences that I described um, today. But look at this from a broader system perspective for a moment. Okay, so rather than like one example here, one example there, I want us to understand things from a systemic perspective. And so that's why I was really interested in the gray hoodie project led by University of Toronto researcher Mohammed Abdallah. He drew parallels between big tech funding for AI and the way that tobacco companies paid for research into the health effects of smoking in the 1950s. Now, this is important. History repeats itself. And if we don't understand history, we are bound to make the exact same mistakes. Mohammed's research found that of the hundreds, over 100 of the computer science faculty that he studied, over 58% of the computer science faculty he studied received funding from big tech. While Abdallah says that industry funding is not necessarily compromising, he worries that it might have some influence by discouraging them to pursue certain research projects if they know, for example, it might be ultimately reviewed by a lawyer. Now, I is this sinking in, right? So what it is, is it's not that they're fully restricting, but if they know that there's going to be some somebody who's going to vet it and review it, like you, you would just not even pursue certain lines of research. And so as a result, like the funding goes to where towards where, where research should be. It's like, oh, I'm looking for more research in this area. So you fund it like crazy. And so you get a lot more research in that area. And then the, the areas that are more critical, you just don't fund them. And so it becomes really hard to publish anything on it. And so that that's a way of changing the discourse in academia towards what you want. So that's the that is the 1950s smoking playbook for manipulating research.